All right. Dylan Carmichael. We had to reschedule a little while back. That's not a hot beer from Wes here at the Bush Light. Dylan, love your new album, Son of a. Thank you. Um, just take us through the process of that album because a lot of great songs. You also work with John. A lot of people might not know John Party was one of the producers on it. Yeah. Um, so some pretty cool stuff for that project. Who's that? I'm not familiar with this name. Some guy. I think, he, I, think he's, I, I think he's from California. He's one of those. Pretty fun guy. Real, pretty fun guy. Real shy. Juan Fiesta, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, uh, it, it actually went by really quick. Uh, it, it, it all happened so fast, but really it took about a year and a half. It was a year and a half process from the first time party and I decided to work together. And uh, yeah, party started sending me songs. Hot beer was actually the first song he sent me. And I was like, he's like, I don't know if you're going to get it. And I listened to it. I was like, I get it. I get it. <laughs> I've lived it, bro. I've lived it. But anyway. Yeah, I thought it was a funny song, man. Like, I just kind of wanted to – I told Party, I said, I, I want to focus on songs that either spark up nostalgia or make you kind of tear up a little bit or that make you laugh so hard that you fall on the ground, you know. And uh, and Hot Beer did that. Son of a did that. And Hose Water, just to name a couple. But I'm real proud of it. And you asked about the process. So um, I had four producers total – on this album, uh, John Party and Ryan Gore co-produced together. And then I had Phil O'Donnell and then Dan Huff. So obviously for producers, there was a lot of processes and everybody kind of had their own uh, own way of doing things. Uh, parties was uh, very much a hang. You know, we were hanging out a lot, spending a lot of time together and- Drinking and, or? Nick uh, Ultra. Yeah. Okay. Ultra. yeah. I don't know. I don't know if uh I, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that actually, but but yeah, he was drinking Mick Ultra and, and I think he he mostly drank Coors Banquet though. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, no, it was a lot of fun. We we hung out. Uh it, it created this environment that was really easy to be uh creative. So and then the uh, Dan Huff stuff was was great. I mean, uh, Dan Huff is literally a, um, uh, I would almost I would say country music veteran, but no, he's a music veteran. I mean, he played on uh, and a legend, but he played on like Shania Twain to um, he played from Shania Twain. He played Shania Twain to um, Bob Seger stuff to eighties, a lot of the eighties rock stuff play guitar and produced and and then we have phil o'donnell who is another legend legendary songwriter legendary producer and uh you know i think i got some of the most raw me stuff with phil so they all you know had their first off all of them are the best in the business in my opinion and i'd almost say it's a fact but uh but they definitely all brought something to the table on this record when you have that many producers on one album i assume they're obviously not all in the same room together like just watching while one does something right so what is that what is that kind of like do you have to go into like separate studios is it all done at one place yeah i mean one of the reasons it took a year and a half i mean it's a it's a process but yeah i mean we we were in probably three like public recording studios total and then we were in multiple private studios doing overdubs and vocals and stuff like that so yeah i mean we cut vocals at dan huff's house we cut vocals for the party stuff at ryan gore studio in barry hill and then phil i'm trying to remember uh we cut vocals at omni um in nashville and then some other stuff over at the castle in Franklin. Uh, it's kind of a funny little story. Uh, see, we finished our vocals for Red, White, Camo, and Blue and Family Tree back in the, I think, the spring of 2021. And Phil, we went outside and we were we had just finished up doing vocals. And I saw there, there were cactus growing everywhere, which you don't see cactus very much in uh, Tennessee and uh, I was like man I wonder how those cactus got here like that's just or I guess cacti or you know yeah, I'm, a, I'm, 
<laughs> yeah, I'm from I'm a I'm from Kentucky, so I don't know nothing about cactus. But I was like, man, they they had these blooms on them, and they, they were just so pretty. And and uh, I told Phil, I said, I think you, if you I think you can cut a piece off of a cactus and just stick it in the ground, and it'll grow. He said, well, we're gonna find out. And he pulled his pocket knife out and flipped it open, cut a little piece of cactus off, and handed it to me. I came home and I kid you not, I took it and threw it in this flower pot on my front porch. And it's like, it's bigger than, bigger than uh, there you go. basketball, just huge now. So, but anyway, that's such a random story, but just a, a random memory that popped in my head in the process of cutting vocals on this record. <laughs> we had a similar thing with a cactus. I think I'm, my, I don't know who bought it in my family, but it was like maybe the couple inches. And now it's yeah. tall, taller than me. Wow. Like, it grew over like six feet. So it's pretty That's cool, awesome. and they're pretty they're pretty damn easy to take care of. If you like plants, if you like greenery, yeah. it's like fuck it. I thought you I thought that story was going somewhere about smoking. Like <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, man, I rolled it up and smoked, and it was awesome. Um, <laughs> speaking of hot beer, which we talked about, obviously hot beer, literally the actual physical product of a hot beer, nobody wants. But there are instances where you kind of have to have a hot beer, right? I, I was in Mexico once and I had a 12 pack of Soul, which was like kind of like their Bud Light, I would say. And maybe I don't want to, right? Something like that. To me, it was. So I'm, I'm drinking it. Um, and it just sat in the sun for hours in, at the beach in Mexico. And then I just kept drinking it warm, like hot. But the environment, in my opinion, dictates so much of that. Right. If you try to drink that at home by yourself, you'd, you'd be gagging. But if you're at a yeah. baseball game sitting in the in the sun, a 90 degree day in July, eh, you get away with it. That gag reflex doesn't happen. What's yeah. the best beer for you? Is it a garage beer, airport beer? Is it a is it a shower beer? Is it a golf course beer? Golf What's... course beer. Is it lawn mowing beer? Is it yeah. Saturday well, 11 a.m. beer right when the football starts? For the sure. Like, that's one well, it's funny you said golf course beer because that I was thinking that, but that's not it. It's that's up there. I would have to say, um, probably on stage beer. Mm. <laughs> well, that's, you know, most of us don't know what that's like. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's a you know, it's a it's a thing. It's like all right, you're you're looking out and there's a, a crowd of wonderful. Uh, people that are raising hell with you and you know you're you just played a, a great song and they're cheering and you grab your beer and cheers and take a drink and there's something See, that's, that's, a nice, that's a nice thing to say because it's like the fans kind of get a little shout out see for me though we, we're big on these garage beers now because i moved into a house in colorado here and yeah, I had a kid. So then the whole drinking changes. It, it becomes like the garage beer becomes an exciting part of dadhood. Um, yeah. But I'm very particular about like, I love Modelo and like Mexican beers. But when it's, when, when it's like, yeah, Dos Equis, like when it's winter, though, I have a hard time drinking those sometimes. I'm like, oh, I want to have a course banquet. I feel like it's winter beer or I want to have a. Really? Yeah, I don't know. It's I'm real weird about this shit. And the music <laughs> I'm listening to, right? So if the kids are oh picking up picking up girls is my one year old's I swear to God, we play that song when he's he loves it. But if I'm listening to music like that, it kind of triggers the oh, I want to have a like a party beer, like a lighter beer. I'm very like I'm not picky about the kind of beer, but it's more about like the situational drinking, which yeah. I'm a big fan of. I get that. I, I was always into uh I don't drink as much beer now. Uh, I, I definitely like Bush Light, but that's kind of the that's the old go to for me. But uh, but I definitely used to like Amber Bach in the winter time. So oh, yeah. I'm a dark beer in the winter kind of guy. I in the summer, yeah. no, go ahead, sorry. Light beer, you know, but yeah. uh, but but also like Coors or not Coors, but uh, Corona, yeah. Corona Extra, Corona Light with a lime. I mean, or Bud Light. Actually, I love Bud Light Lime. That's one of the things that uh, it's an acquire. It's either like they hate it or they love it kind of thing. But <laughs> I love Bud Light Lime. I feel like Bud Light Lime is one of those underrated like festival beers where you're yeah, like, we have, somebody wrote a post on uh, on Whiskey Riff for that. Like, it's one of those ones you wouldn't really expect, but like 
you know, you can, it's a marathon beer. You can drink a lot of them. It's hot out. Yes. You know, they come in a tall can. It's, it's yeah, perfect, perfect. Absolutely. I'm pretty partial to the ski lift beer. And with Steve, you being out in, in Colorado right now, you got you to gotta try one of those ski lift beers where you're just, you're getting up there and you just pop that top. You're going out over the, the mountain. You can just see for miles and miles. Yeah, I've never experienced that, but that I can see why that would be. Well, awesome. the mountain beer for sure. I have not the ski lift mountain beer. How taking an ed- taking an edible and going on a hike into a mountain where you have the views and see the elk, and then you pop a beer that's in your bag. That's that's up there for the best beer. That's oh, for there. sure. Yeah, but um, so yeah, that song is great. Did Hardy write that song? Did I read that? Oh, Hardy wrote that song. Yep. Along with some other great songwriters, he's a he's a he's good with his words. He's pretty clever as a writer. Um, something people might not know about you is that your uncles are John Michael Montgomery and Eddie Montgomery. How much influence musically, as you you know, growing up high school, you you loved high school, right, and then went to Nashville. How yeah. big of a help have they been or kind of throughout your career and, and where you're going now? Oh, man. I mean, I think that 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 I would be – it would be ignorant for me to say that I wasn't somehow influenced by that scenario. I mean, I, I heard them on the radio, saw them on TV, and, you know, uh, it was it's one of those things where, you know, everybody else in my family also did. So it was either going to kind of deter you from it or it was, or it was going to attract you to it. I was one of the ones in the family that was attracted to it, along with my cousin Walker, who yep. uh, is also out there doing it. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I love it. Um, I, you know, I, I always ask advice from them and, and, uh, and, and asked them like, uh, and, and also I was kind of in the crossfire of a lot of those conversations when I was younger, they taught, I, I would hear them, talking about it and stuff like that and it always just kind of sparked my interest but but i'll tell you what really did it what kind of uh what kind of because you know i'm more of a traditional i have more of the roots in my songs and i think the reason for that is the merle haggards once i started getting into the merle haggards and willie nelson and uh, I even really love Southern Rock and Charlie Daniels and Skinner and Hank Jr. and all that kind of stuff. That really influenced me a lot too. But the but the initial, you know, I think I want to be an entertainer. I want to be on TV. I want to be on radio. Yeah, that's what got me. Nice. Um, and then my mom is also a singer, so my mom and I would sit around and pick and sing. And uh, and I had a band when I was fourteen, and we would go around the the uh, boat docks around my hometown because I grew up on a lake. We go around the boat docks and we'd play cover songs. But, but the thing, the interesting thing about that was, you know, the drummer wanted to be a metal drummer because our, our resources were limited with musicians in Bergen, Kentucky. <laughs> so the drummer wanted to be a metal drummer and the bass player wanted to be a reggae player and the other guitar player wanted to be this and the other that. So like we were literally going from like, three days grace to uh baby got back to ice ice baby to george Strait to i mean like bob marley metallica <laughs> <laughs> to bob yeah. marley i remember we used to do a you know what i'm talking about when are you singing this it's a steer it up you know yeah. Oh, you gotta you gotta do all these covers now and put it on like a covers album <laughs> people are gonna be expecting like 90s country and southern rock yeah. and they're gonna be getting bob marley but you know what i love bob marley me too yeah and i love metallica that black yeah. album there's nothing like it the most party amazing. got party got to sing on the uh remake not the remake yeah. but the covers project or whatever that was but yeah there was like <laughs> did you give him any shit did you give him any shit for that shoot i loved it man we were up on his bus like (laughs) i just don't know if people get like it's one of those bands i feel like a lot of guys would get jealous something somebody else gets to but it's it's so hard to mimic their sound too because the album has like every type of artist on it doesn't it if i'm not mistaken oh yeah tons of them so it's kind of cool that they kind of played with that but i love it 
I loved how you mentioned like deciding to be a singer. Like it was so like, like my dad does hardwood floors and like I could have decided to do that. <laughs> yeah. But you're just like, yeah, I decided to be a singer, entertainer. Like you're really fucking good at it. <laughs> it's like, like, oh, like you, you don't act like any talent in like God's gift. Like, a, like went into that conversation. <laughs> Man, I, I tell you, the uh, it, it wasn't. It, it, I mean, I say that, but but it wasn't easy. You know, it was like when I was. What 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 kind of what got me to where I am now is literally, I sound like some broken record, but it was persistence, and it was um, honestly, it's easy to be persistent. It's easy to be consistent and have the drive to do it when you love it. And I absolutely was just madly in love with particularly singing. And I just never didn't sing. Like I would sing in school, in the shower, in my truck, in the car, and uh, playing basketball and riding my dirt bike. And like literally any, any aspect of life, I was singing. I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. So, um, there, you know, I mean, I will say this, like the, what I sound like when I talk comes from growing up where I grew up around the people I grew up around, but literally, and this goes out to the aspiring musicians. I'm not going to sit here and act like my family is the reason I sing good. Like literally anyone can dedicate the time and put the hard work in and be a great singer, a great songwriter. I really believe that. I really believe it. And and people say all the time, they're like, no, nah, there's no way. I wasn't born to do it. I don't have a naturally good voice and all this. Some people move faster than others, but I think everyone can get there with, with the hard work and the persistence. Because let me tell you, when I was 15 years old, I sounded like a dying freaking cat, man. Like carry I said, a tune in a bucket. <laughs> oh yeah, even the tone of my voice was real awkward because, like, it turned out to be a blessing because because I've got like a deep voice and um, you know it's kind of gravelly and stuff. But when I was fifteen, man, it was like the even the tone was like I sounded goofy, man. I just sounded weird and like I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket and. And same for guitar. Like, I was the worst guitar player. So all my buddies that were playing in my band with me, they're like, yeah, you should probably just not play on the song. <laughs> it doesn't sound good. You know, so I was, I, I'm a late bloomer, honestly. Uh, late bloomer with songwriting, too. I mean, I, I, I'm just now starting to get to a point where I'm really comfortable with my songwriting. So just takes persistence. And, and uh, I, I don't believe that I, you know, uh, cheated. And, you know, being born in a music family, I really think that the hard work is what does it. Well, He's, there's like movies with like um, Colin Farrell and Crazy Heart Comes to Mind and Bradley Cooper and A Star is Born, like learning to sing and like doing a pretty damn good job of it. So I'm, I'm not saying I disagree with what you're saying. Like, I think you can learn to but I think you were also born with a great voice. Well, what, what, well, what I was going to say, too, is. There's always a talk with, I, I can't stand the singing competition shows like anymore, but back in the day, obviously like Carrie Underwood comes to mind. Right. I was like, if she was just, if, if you could take a time machine and she said, oh, I'm going to still sing, like maybe I'm not going to be on the show, but I'm going to still try. I think we would all still know the name Carrie Underwood today, you know, oh, the show yeah. maybe whatever helps, but like when you're that good, you're that good. And when you work I assuming similarly that hard you're gonna you, you got the talent and you got the work ethic it's yeah you know because a lot of people don't have the other I, I think that's what we see sometimes with Nashville that we kind of turned us off over the years was more of the the LA image of the like celebrity versus the guy grinding or the girl like just doing everything like it's it kind of turned into this like Pony, like dog and pony show where it was like hey like look yeah. at my image and not so much of the grinding at least you didn't right. see it enough though i know a lot of people are doing it um but the stories about the grinding and with with tiktok and stuff you don't hear about it anymore so i think yeah. for us having a business like we always get i want i don't want to say partial but we, you get you root for people that work their ass off absolutely no where they're coming from so that, uh, that's well said for people out there but yeah 
and uh, I, and it's not for everyone. That's, that's one thing yeah. I actually have, have only learned in the last three or four years is that uh, up until three or four years, now I've been doing that. I moved to Nashville a decade ago. I, I knew I wanted to do this, but I didn't discover whether or not this was for me until like three or four years ago, because you honestly like the, the, the cold hard truth. And this is kind of an unfortunate reality for record labels and people that invest in artists, but you don't really know if this is for you until you get out there and you actually for real start doing it and you tour and you start having to make really big decisions that are going to affect others people other people's livelihood and other people's money and then um you get your wife or husband and kids and dogs and your house and all that and then you're kind of away from it a lot and then it, that's when you're like I feel like that's when a lot of people are like yeah this is not for me I can't be away from my kids I can't I just got this house and I can't even like be in it because I'm on the road so unfortunate circumstances, a lot of people realize it's not for them in that moment. So far, I've been lucky and I have not been burnt out. I love every minute of it. Uh, I think the road is actually I know the road is for me because like when I'm on the road, like there's no better thing in the whole world than when I'm on the road and my woman gets to be there with me because that's my two favorite things in the whole world. And I, I get to have both of them in that moment and it's yeah so that's how i know the road is totally for me like i never get burnt out i mean we've had vans break down and band members just be like oh i'm not gonna show up and then like we get there and sound checks for or a speaker blows up or somebody got too drunk or um <laughs> like this we don't like we don't have a set list and we're running up on stage like what are we gonna play what are we gonna play you know i've like we've seen all of the i've had to do my laundry in a hotel room and uh, I mean, the list just like not eat for like two days. I don't look like I haven't have, I've ever not eaten for two days, but believe it or not, it happened. So I've seen the ups and downs of it. And honestly, I love every daggone bit of it. That's awesome. Yeah. The, the two drunk comment without naming names, what, are, are there any funny stories about just that whole situation about somebody getting a little too, like, can't make, the, can't make the state. You look like a guy that could handle his, I mean, it was quite a bit. I've been too sauced on a podcast before, and that's nowhere near as like exciting as getting up on stage or as nerve wracking, probably. Yeah. So, I, so I imagine there's times when it's like, shit, I gotta, I had too much. I've, I've been overserved. There was a, there was a guy in my band back in um, like 20 something, I don't know, 2018, maybe. Wasn't that long ago, but, uh, this guy in my band, <laughs> had a little bit too much, had a little too much fun. And I, I was on a diet and I was really, really strict about it. Like I was doing really good. I lost some weight. Um, and it's kind of one of those things where it's a combination of, of maybe even just being really tired and like strung out on the road, not strung out from drugs, just mean like Bob Seger, like been on the road for weeks. Um, and I had bought these breakfast burritos from McDonald's. Nice. And I was walking into a hotel and I took a bite out of it. And in that moment, I realized that I just destroyed my diet. So I got mad and I just go and throw it up in the air. <laughs> and this thing goes and explodes all over this dude's truck. <laughs> so my band joked with me forever. They're like, they're like, oh, you can't trust that man with a burrito. <laughs> Did that? Did that lead to the drinking that day? Do what? Did that did the getting pissed off about the diet lead to overserving yourself in 2018 oh, or whoever man. that was? No, that was like that was late at night. That was oh, like okay. a late at night <laughs> burrito. Yeah. So I say breakfast burrito. I was having a breakfast burrito for dinner, but a really late dinner, like 11 p.m. 
McDonald's breakfast is the best though, man. Those McMuffins, <laughs> come on. The hash brown. Can't go wrong. Oh, I love those things, man. I like those breakfast burritos. But they don't make them like they used to. Really? I never went with the burritos. I always went with old school McMuffins and yeah. maybe a McGriddle, maybe a biscuit, but absolutely. My wife does the bagel, and I'm like, who the hell eats the McDonald's bagel? And then they don't have it some McDonald's. I'm like, yeah, it's because nobody likes it. What do you mean? The ice, the ice cream isn't even ice cream, but it's so amazing when it wor- <laughs> when it's working, when the machine is actually working, functional. Right. Yeah, because that's really the problem is the, the machine's broken. <laughs> right. uh, you have a, you got that nice collection of whiskeys yeah. behind you. What's your favorite over there? Um. So I really like I've I've, I've enjoyed the uh, the basil Hayden toast. Oh, I love basil. Yeah, Ooh. yeah. So that's like a double charred version of the basil Hayden. And then um, the ones I have I've, I haven't tried most of these, but I'm a fan of Knob Creek. This is a little book, which is uh, Booker's, but it's Booker's grandson, Freddie, uh, his batch. That's chapter five, chapter one chapter three and then here's a rare i think that's a nine year uh knob creek still in the box that's a limited edition knob creek there 2001 um what else we got here and then this is the uh rip, old rip, rip van winkle which i haven't cracked open yet i haven't tried it but that's a, a very sought after bourbon there that's so I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be a special occasion. Uh, Old Tub is the like the original unfiltered recipe of just the regular white label Jim Beam. Oh, but wow. there's a story, and I'm going to try and tell it the best way I can, but the, the best way I remember. But it's something along the lines they hadn't named Jim Beam Jim Beam yet. And so this was like a – like come up with something slap a label on it and it was old tub and then later on became jim beam same recipe and then now this is just like a just a storyteller bottle that's like a kind of a replica of the original back then you know they didn't have labels and stuff like that as much it was closer to prohibition times and then um uh, i'm still learning about all these i like uh uh, uh, angels envy a lot oh yeah yeah it's and, uh, you asked my favorite i'm gonna say that basil hayden toast is my favorite uh old overholt which these are all things that i've gotten that i haven't tried yet i mean like unfortunately we i'm so daggone busy man i don't yeah i don't really have a time to kind of sit around i don't want to take one of those on an airplane or whatever <laughs> I don't really have a whole bunch of time to sit and try the whiskeys, but as things slow down this winter, I'm sure Shayla and I will dig in and really uh, try these things. I imagine as a proud Kentuckian, you gotta you gotta know your shit when it comes to drinking bourbon, right? Yeah, I mean at least enough, at least <laughs> enough to kind of just hold your own and have an opinion about it of some sort. Because really, the thing about bourbon is that you get familiar enough with the different notes that you can pick them out. And then after that, you don't really, I mean, the connoisseurs, if you're trying to hang out with connoisseurs, you got to know the history and all that kind of stuff. Me, I've just, I've kind of learned to identify the vanilla and the nutty stuff and the smoky and all those different notes a little bit. And then, then after that, it's like, wow, I really like the smokiness of this bourbon. Yeah. No, I love bourbon. I love the, yeah, after after you get the notes, that's that's you wake up twelve hours later. Where's my car keys? Where's my wallet? Where's my phone? Did I charge my phone last night? <laughs> but uh, no, that's that's so true. And I just bought a bottle. Uh, my wife's back to liking it. She had a phase where she didn't like it. I love bourbon. I feel like there's a price range though. It's like once you hit thirty bucks, you can get something really really good. But even yeah. like the lower stuff, it's like if you're mixing it, it's gonna be fine. But so I'm like trying to spend like. You know, there's there's those like crazy like Pappy Van Winkle's like three grand a bottle, right? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. We had it once, Wes. Was that with Cole? Or yeah. And Cole, um, Cole it was hard. Himself. Yeah, it was hard to like because it was in a plastic cup, and we were kind of already drunk. I was like, man, uh-huh. I didn't appreciate that enough. On a yeah. bus. 
but some restaurants will sell it like one glass is what like 50 bucks yeah. or something yeah so it's you know if you want to go for it but red wine big fan of red wine these days okay beer bourbon I, I there's not much i don't like <laughs> have, you, have you had george Strait's tequila to no that's no, great that's haven't. great that's like high-end tequila what's it, what's it called codigo yeah codigo c-o-d-i-g-o no, it's really really I've good had, that's a, that's like good. smooth as i thought george clooney's casamigos was like oh this is the smoothest shit i've ever had yeah and then we tried straights um and we were like whoa i mean you it's legit well, on ice, a little squeeze of lime, that's it. You don't need anything. Yeah. Like, there's nothing you need with it. And no hangover. Awesome. Love that. Yeah. I mean, what do you do for a hangover? Is it McDonald's burritos or is it something else? <laughs> no, I actually, uh, kind of interesting. I, I don't get hangovers, and I never have. Would be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> the only you thing look I like say, a guy that would say that in a, in a good way. No, I mean, I, I'm just being like for real with you. Like, I've, I've, I've never gotten hangovers. The only thing I'll say is that, like, I, that I've been exhausted because it usually relates to that I just stayed up late. The night ah, before. see, I, that's that's what I tell my wife. Yeah. When you have a kid, what I, it, it's, are you hungover? No, I'm just really tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but I don't, I don't, and then, oh, I'm going to take a nap during the during the college football game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when you know. There's that. nothing worse than being hungover with a kid. Oh, my uh, God. Oh, yeah. my God. But, you know, I like a little steam room, maybe some bone broth, maybe a Pedialyte, and then maybe a few more beers to kind of get you back to where you were. And yeah. Hair like of the dog. <laughs> hair, the, hair of the dog is what does it. Hair of the dog. I'll tell you what, what I find interesting about uh, – the uh the the hangover uh cures out there so a lot of people say like greasy cheeseburgers but you would think some kind of like super food maybe the green powder stuff with all the vitamins yeah. and stuff everyone's go-to is like the worst thing you could do to well, your then you just want to sleep really it, 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 yeah. me, it's that's why like honestly like bone broth something like nutritional and rich like a hearty sure. broth from like an Asian restaurant or something like that, yeah. a little bit of spicy broth. Yeah. That's broth. where like put, you get that salt, you get the, that collagen, you get all that stuff kind of working inside of you. And then boom. Yeah, as long as you right drink clean your water, because that salt's going to yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, retain your fluids. I just, speaking of like being a road warrior and all that stuff, I mean, we've talked to so many people on here and it's that, that seems to be the hardest thing talking about greasy burgers and stuff is, staying on a path of whether it's working out or a diet or not yeah. drinking too early if you if you and the boys are just bored as hell at some in the middle of north dakota wherever you're touring right, right? and you're is that part kind of tricky that's tricky man seriously it's like it's when people say that they're not joking like it's yeah. because the the thing is is you're always you feel the bus stop and then you're like over there and then you like right window. Oh, we're at Love's. We're always at Love's. Love's only has Burger King, McDonald's, Taco Bell, and fast food restaurants. Now, every now and then, if you get in there and like within normal business hours, which we're usually not, like during the day, we're usually like three in the morning. You don't want to eat that salad. It's been there for a while. So you can't really eat salads. So, but the good thing about a bus and, and we're, we don't always travel on a bus. We we're still in a van, but we, it just depends on the circumstances. Sometimes we take buses. It's just like a little vacation for us when we get to be on a bus, mm -hmm. but in a van, you can take a cooler. So there's ways you can do it in a bus. You can put everything in the fridge, but um, there's ways to be healthy. There really is. It's just, it's in normal circumstance, I say normal, but like staying at home and not traveling circumstances, it's hard to eat healthy. Then it's extra hard to eat healthy when you're essentially like always on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You don't have Tim McGraw with his traveling gym, knocking right. on the door to flip tires at six in the morning. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> but I mean, seriously, like, I think the working out and the exercising thing, I think there's really something to it. Not that uh, your food isn't important as well, but like the, uh, but there's something really, it's like fellowship. 
when you get together and you exercise, everybody feels good and you play a better show. And but you, you guys try and do that a lot. Do I? You guys try and do that a lot on the road is like get a workout in before a show. It's something we just started working on at the end of uh, 2021. Yeah, but uh, I've always done it, but not everyone in the group has always done it. We've just had a couple here and there that do it on their own. Um, but as a group, we kind of started working on it. Um, I, I would, I wouldn't mind like having one person just being like the athletic oh, coordinator type thing. Yeah, drill sergeant. That's like, all right, your job is literally to punch us in the mouth if we won't get up at 6 a.m like we need someone like that yeah. so we figure out who in the band is qualified for that position and i'll tell you who it's not it's not me because it's not. <laughs> every, with every every band needs that like shredded bass player that's just like <laughs> just absolutely jacked and with trains like, on the side yeah yeah, yeah. um with touring too i, I you're i know you're a big fisherman Yep. Uh, we launched Riff Outdoors. We got our, I got my Mossy Oak fishing hoodie on here. Um, All that. Yeah. So we got to send you some stuff, but uh, do you try to fish where you travel to? If you're going to a place, like obviously if you're in the Colorado area, there's a lot of great trout and fly fishing and, and the yeah. Dakotas and Wyoming and all that. But do you try to do it when you're going to a part of the country that's like known for fishing? Are you trying to get out there even if it's for a little bit? Um. I do. Yeah. I, I'm not a big fly fisherman. I've never done it's it. It's hard. Yeah, I haven't. It's good. I've just never, <laughs> I don't know that I, it's one of those things where I don't think about it a lot because I've never done it. And I, I don't, maybe probably don't know what I'm missing, but um, I've also never had the opportunity. I, I mean, I've had a couple people here and there uh, say, Hey, you want to go fly fishing? But like the problem is I'm in, I'm in a point in my career where I'm like nose to the grindstone. Like i we hit one city and and then I hop on an airplane. And I go to another city and do a radio tour thing, and then I fly to the another city to meet up with the band that I was just with two days ago. And yeah. so it's it's never like it's never stopping. Like this train rolls and rolls and rolls, and we don't really have the opportunity to be like, yeah, you know, let's take this up this time of the day and let's all go fly fishing. <laughs> but that would be awesome, though. Yeah. I mean, I'm more of like when I'm at home and I have a little bit of time at home. I live on Old Hickory Lake. So I just go down there and do a little fishing, you know, yeah. but, uh, I don't have enough. I don't, I don't make enough time, but now during the shutdown period, I did a whole lot of fishing, but we didn't fly anywhere. And, uh, I don't really think there's any trout fishing around here. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. but, uh, but you asked if I to make time on the road to fish. So in the past, I've always brought fishing poles. And if we just happen to, play in a venue that has a lake close or something like that i'll go out there and fish for a while you know for two or three hours and i've I mean, had some luck yeah i mean that's that's got to be a good way to clear your head before a show that's it's a good oh, little sure. therapy session absolutely we, we were talking earlier about you being a proud kentuckian and with the bourbon stuff but do you think that because i kind of think kentucky is really carrying country music right now yeah guys like tyler childers Carly Pierce just won a CMA for female vocalist. Yeah. Obviously, Chris Stapleton cleaned up at the CMAs too. Yep. Um, and then even some of the more, you know, indie alternative type, non-mainstream artists. Like, I think it's just some of the best music in the business right now. What are, what are yeah. your kind of thoughts on the, the way Kentucky's really like showing up in the country music world? Kentucky uh, tends to be, it seems like, Kentucky tends to be the the more um, like the the kind of go against the rules, um, not as mainstream, which which is a term that I'm not really happy with using for for what they're doing, um, because like really is is it not mainstream because i think it is i think tyler childers is probably one of the biggest stars on the planet right now so so calling it not mainstream is wrong and also calling it like americana is maybe wrong too so i don't really know what to call it but like the the but the the sturgill simpsons from kentucky tyler childers y'all might be able to help me with this um and then i'm trying to think of some others from kentucky kelsey walden who kelsey walden are you familiar with her no, I've checked Kelsey Walden out. I mean, she's, yeah, she's really good. 
But other than that, we got a handful, you know, Carly Pierce. You love that duo, Sunday Best. Are they Sunday, from Kentucky West? Sunday Best. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're I'm awesome. Champagne. They came back together. They were like, they separated yeah. and they got back together. Yeah. We, we were big fans of that. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, I think Kentucky is still, uh, a lot of parts of Kentucky are still a few years back there, if that makes any sense. I don't think that I know that. And, uh, and actually, that's a really good thing because it's a really simple place to grow up. Cole Chaney, and... sorry. What's that? Cole Chaney. I, I was double-checking where he was from. Cole Chaney's a really good artist, very yeah, similar in that vein of like Tyler Childers. Y'all are teaching me, man. Um, but I, I think it's just a, a place that that is full of um, a lot of inspiration. You know, you have poverty to uh, wealthy to uh, blue-collar to – white collar all the way across the board, a lot of different uh, culture in Kentucky. And um, because it's, it's so like you go to Western Kentucky, it's flat. You go to central Kentucky, it's hilly, but there's horses and bourbon everywhere. Go to Eastern Kentucky, <laughs> it's mountains and coal mining and just a really kind of bland definition of Kentucky right there. But, but there's a lot going on there. And I think that a lot of people don't get to see it because the biggest city in Kentucky is actually really a small city. And a lot of people don't know much about Kentucky, but it's a, well, we were just there for a while. Oh, and Stapleton. I, oh yeah. Stapleton. Yeah, you know, Stapleton. That's, that's, yeah. We were just there for a wedding and it was one of the, speaking of hangovers, the worst hangover I've had in about <laughs> seven, seven years <laughs> for, Oh my God. <laughs> like, oh shit! Yeah, borderline. Like, am I it, like? Do I need to like? Yeah. Is something going on here internally? <laughs> like, you're yeah. bad. How old are yeah. you? How old are you? Twenty eight. Twenty eight. Oh man. So I'm thirty three. So okay. This idea of not having hangovers, depending on how much you drink and how much you you work out before a show, it's, it, it might catch up to you. It <laughs> might catch up to you. Because yeah, I didn't think I ever had one really uh, truly until you kind of made a mis- you make a mistake and you do a few shots you weren't planning on into your 30s. And then next thing you know, it's two in the morning, you sleep none, you're covered in Taco Bell wrappers. It, it, it's all just I told the story. Taco Bell wrappers. I told the story to Runaway June. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm repeating, but like I was like so hungover on the flight home from Kentucky that it was like seven in the morning. I I paid the extra for like a first class seat because I was like, I don't care. I got to get the fuck out of here. When the plane lands, I need to get out. Like I, I knew, I knew my situation. And the lady comes over and I didn't think they even serve booze. And she gives me the beer and I'm like, what's the strongest one you got? Like, I just need something to kind of level off. And somehow like I chipped my tooth. I was like half awake. Oh my so goodness. that's a shitty hangover, dude. Like if you're on, you're hungover from three days of drinking, you're on a plane at seven in the morning, you're asking, you get a beer. And then all of a sudden you think you have a piece of salt in your mouth and it's, it, you accidentally chipped your tooth somehow. I, I the bottle, I don't even know what happened. Yeah. Just doing one of these. <laughs> like I just need to get <laughs> turbulence. Turbulence. <laughs> turbulence. Oh, man. There was a great video we shared. This guy, you know, when you, tra- if you travel in Europe or kind of anywhere, I guess I, over like um, outside of the country when you buy they have the liquor store like yeah. at the airport you can buy the bottle but they like put in that bag a lot of times yeah but one one video we posted i think wes you share this the turbulence gets so bad and this old grandpa takes takes his like bottle of booze that he bought like rips it out of the bag and just starts like chugging it ferociously because t- when you got bad turbulence and people are like bouncing out of their seats, he just said, fuck it. And he just started drinking the, from the bottle. It's like, are you afraid of flying? If you get a little turbulence, are you? Oh man. When I was uh, a few drinks, in, you're like, yeah, fuck it. It's fine. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it was. I, when I was uh, a, a teenager, I was the first time, actually I, I probably was 19 or so. My first time I, I was nervous. I mean, I was really nervous. I had the whole, like every little bump scared me to death. I was going to, like, I felt like I was going to throw up. I was so nervous. And, uh, and then I didn't fly much back then. So it was like a once a year type thing. And then when I I hadn't flown in a long time, and then I was told I was going to go on radio tour and I was going to have to fly a lot. And I was really nervous about it. And for some reason, when I went to, to go on my first trip for radio tour, I just was not like it, it just had gone away at some point. And I've, I've never 
been even the least bit nervous about flying. Yeah, it's just. What's that like? like? <laughs> Wes, you get it worse than me. Even. I'm like, for me, it's it's going like, well, okay, so there's a one in whatever million chance. Just doing the math. If if I'm in the plane, the the one in the three million. If I'm in the plane that's going to go down out of that three million, it's my time. Like, <laughs> let's do it, baby. Like, hit the ground, man. Like, just do it. Like, if it's, I'm the guy. <laughs> That's in the plane for well, one out of three million. <laughs> you're like, I'll take it. I'll take well, that. Well, now with all the like, I, it's almost an honor. I want the memorial at the CMA Awards. People, people, <laughs> people have freaked out. Like, I feel like it's gotten a lot worse after COVID. Like, you see all these crazy videos of people on planes losing their fucking minds, fist fight. We posted a lot of this because it's just so entertaining. But yeah, fist fights and this, and I'm always. I always go to the air, like airport now, not so much nervous about flying, but more, all right, I got to be ready if this ship pops off. Like if people start acting crazy, what do I do? Do I grab the guy? Do I try to break it up? Do I just stand back? Right. Do I, cause it's, and it just like never seems to happen when I'm around, but then I see, Oh, at the Denver airport, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't fuck. Did I missed the shit. It's like, cause that's been happening. Have you ever been, seen a crazy situation? I think the craziest Nashville moment we had was Nashville airport hungover, of course. And, we're sitting right next to Vince Gill and yeah. we're too hungover and probably stink. And we don't, e- don't even want to approach him because we're nervous. So nervous growing up, listening to Vince and this parade of middle-aged women are just sitting next to him while their husband just sit in the back and they just sit next to him one at a time. And they sit next to him and they, they take a selfie and he's so nice to everybody. And they just leave. And I was like, yeah. man, I was like, this is a cool thing about a Nashville airport is that you see Vince Gill just hanging out, taking pictures with middle-aged women, but <laughs> nice yeah, guy. Saw, um, it seems like a really Ronnie nice guy <laughs> at the airport. You, Ronnie Dunn? Ronnie Dunn. Fuck. We had him on the podcast. He was awesome. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Good guy, yeah. Ronnie Dunn. Did you talk to him yeah. or no? No, I didn't talk to him. I think I overheard him go, whoa, over in the background, though. <laughs> Uh, the craziest thing I ever saw was actually in Colorado. I think it was Denver Airport or somewhere. That that rings a bell. But anyway, we saw like a crowd of people and then like airport security. And they were all just kind of crowded in this like circle. And me and my guitar player walked by and we're like, I wonder what's going on over there. And then we just didn't say any, we didn't even think anything after that. But we had uh, flown out and then we had got somewhere we saw on the news that some guy just kind of went crazy and like jumped over the balcony. Jesus. And, and I guess that's why all those people were gathered around this guy. Cause he just like jumped off the balcony. So he had a bad day. Yeah. Um, you know, poor guy, but whatever that, whatever made him want to do that. Well, the but, airport uh, sometimes brings out the fucking demons and some people. Yeah. Yeah. But, and, uh, and the diarrhea. <laughs> but anyway we were uh, uh we were talking about some, i had a thought a second ago but <laughs> I, lose, I lose those i lose those <laughs> we were talking about crazy airport situations yeah one time i got off a plane and there was a mob of people that wanted to see apparently there was a group of like k-pop stars like korean oh, pop wow. korean pop stars and there was a group of like 200 people waiting outside the airport for this oh, no, that's <laughs> it was like a group a different and i'm that like carrying different. my backpack and i walk out and they're just standing there oh, and we, like, we've had what was going post, what, we did a post once and we oh wait was that ariana grande somebody somebody about was it bts was well, like somebody their yeah. fans got angry because some artist was like ahead of them on itunes yeah it was about luke combs they were mad that Luke Combs was beating out one of their, whichever artist it was. And they were like, who the fuck is Luke Combs? <laughs> our Twitter got like, our Twitter was just like hijacked for like 12 hours. I was like, I don't, what the hell are these notifications? <laughs> and it, they were so angry that Luke was ahead of them on the iTunes chart. That's like, so funny. You don't want to, oh man, like you get real fucking. 
you got to be careful. You know, country music. That I'm. I'm going to use that as a segue. Uh, and I know y'all are interviewing me, but I'm going to interview you. But it's not an interview. It's, it's no, a we're just hanging out. Podcast. We well, hate calling it interviews. Craft, but but you know <laughs> what I mean. It's your podcast, but I'm going to. So country music's in a really good spot. It's in a it's in a great spot where, you know, there's a lot of resources for for you know obviously independent artists to use to get their name out there they can be on tv shows like yellowstone and yeah then they can be on the radio they can do the record label route they can do the independent route they can make records in their house and upload them to spotify apple music and and uh i, I don't know i don't really have a question i'm just kind of making the point that country music and what what made me think of that was uh y'all were talking about uh um, Luke Combs like breaking records and like over pop people, which is not something that happens every day. But Luke Combs is is really um, is it's a really um, what's the word I'm trying to trying to use here? It's really exciting to see Luke Combs do his thing because Luke Combs is the real deal. Mm -hmm. Like that's what what you see is what you get there there's no like record label or management company or pr company or anybody that's like telling luke oh man you know you need to grow your beard like this and you need to have the hat and you need to wear this shirt and then you got to uh you know you write songs about this and then write songs about that and then we're going to record them and they're going to sound like this like nobody's doing that like luke's just doing what he wants to do and it's freaking working and I, I, it's been a while, at least, since country music's kind of been in that place where somebody's not like trying to cultivate it into this certain thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's just a, a thought. No, I mean, I, I had it in my notes here to kind of bring you up with in the likes of the Luke Combs when it comes yeah. to yeah this '90s resurgence sound. And I, yeah. you're another guy where I think it's it's organic. It's not. So is, that, is that what it is about? So I get compared to Luke Combs a lot. And, and it's I'm the not, sound for me when I listen to you or I listen to Luke, I go back to being a kid eight years or I go old. back or I go back to my burnt CD when I was 15. I got a car or whatever and the songs I put on. And I, it's a very yeah. similar feel and our, sound. Is our voices similar? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, a little bit, but like, but like, no, I don't think it's necessarily the voice. I, I think you're like, so distinct. Like, it's so just like I can your pick your voice out i can pick his out and i think that's for but it's me the, it's the sound of the music the, the nine but, the, but even the songwriting too you know, it's all right okay. do you know who has the same sounding voice i'm not gonna name it's all these like pop country guys that are young they all yeah. sound exactly the same like those are the re that's what i hate about I mean, we're very open about this. Like, that, those are the th sounds and the songs that I'm just like, come on. Yeah. So when anybody has like a distinctive, whatever, whatever it is, and it's, I, and we know it's natural because we also know a lot of that shit, like much cultivating, we, a lot of that stuff is orchestrated and built in yeah. a lab. Um, so I automatically gravitate towards that. And, yeah. Um, I mean, you like picking up girls I mentioned earlier, working with Cadillac three, they're like, when they're, when Jaren's singing or doing it, like, you, you know, Cadillac three, when you hear them, that's them. Like, there's not, there's not no confusion. Doubt. Nobody. You yeah. know. I would say there, there's artists like yourself, Luke Combs, John Party, Carly, Ashley McBride, Lainey Wilson, Randall King. Yep. And a lot of their music and your, your music, it brings me back to a place of like nineties country, early two thousands country. It's kind of that like sound that's like familiar, and, familiar, yeah. and, and, and real, and you know, real country music. But it's it's instruments, <laughs> my God. Yeah, yeah. you got instrument. you got fucking drums, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like, was, we yeah, like that. that yeah. yeah, and and to me, that that is country music. Like I don't know that I ever like for real considered like to, like the maybe not the the genres like the i just mean like the like the period of country music that i felt like i know as country music and obviously that's different for everyone it's kind of crazy to think about like people that were young kids when luke bryan was at his you know he's still at his peak by the way but 
when he like had to, you know, we wrote in trucks <laughs> after that. Cause I actually thought that stuff was very nineties, but like yeah. some of the, when he got a little more poppier uh, and then the Florida Georgia gosh. line, I don't want this night to end. Yeah. Chase Rice and basically bro country, which, which all of them, from what I've learned is that they're all very aware of what was going on there. They're, they weren't like oblivious to what they were doing. They all made a great living doing it too. But, uh, but anyway, um, it's kind of crazy to think that there are young kids that, that were young and very impressionable during that time period when that was on the radio and that was out and that was very hot that are getting ready to be teenagers that are getting ready to be twenties. That, that is country music. Yeah. You know, kind of crazy. but to me, nineties country was my country music, but I also listen to, uh, you know, a lot of the seventies and eighties stuff too, because I really, my family loved, loved it and listened to it all the time. And so I grew up around, uh, uh, you know, Merle Haggard, misery and gin, like memories and drinks don't mix too well, you know, um, yeah. all the Haggard sounds and stuff like that. Uh, what's the, um, we should just say you play really I'm day, just getting <laughs> by with my kids and a wife but i've been a working man damn near all my life I'm go back working i mean come on you gotta oh. release a cover of that would you yeah would you ever consider like doing some cover stuff i know you covered obviously you know your uncle and troy with lucky man but yeah um that would be something to do. I think yeah. you could pull off some covers. You got that voice, whether it's Southern rock, whether it's. I want to do Turn the Page by Bob Seger. I've been wanting yeah. to put a cover of that on my record for years, but I've just not been able to find like a producer or like anyone that's kind of on the same page about that. No one gets as excited about it as I do. And also because Metallica did one and then Like a Rock. <laughs> like a rock I love it. <laughs> they're like hey that's I a commercial <laughs> i could do uh you know the one um i even love it. it's kind of high for me but oh yeah <laughs> you know what, what is that song uh night moves not wait moves. who but who hasn't covered night moves that's kind of the problem yeah you yeah. want to go you want to go I, I think we've I mean, my God, how many artists that we share on the site? But if you're going to cover moves. Bob Seger, you kind of got to cover a song that people will know by Bob yeah. Seger. I mean, That's I could true. do like, I could do like, she packed up her bags and she took off down the road. You know that one? Some spot, baby. You know that? That's like one that a lot of people don't know. Well, no. Like, well, that's I, why I was joking about like a rock. It just got a, it's a connotation for a truck commercial. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know. That's so true. it's like if you cover that, people be like, "Oh, like he, he got a truck deal somewhere." Like, you know, they're, yeah, they're bringing it back. Like, like a rock. That's a great song, though. I mean, uh, I agree. Right. I'm a huge Seeger fan. Love some Seeger. I feel like here's this is something I've noticed. I think a lot of the country artists I like. Are big Seeger fans like really? yourself, Kim Moore, guys like Eric Church. Like, yeah. there's like a weird a point. But I'm also kind of partial to the not partial. Like, I really like all like Heartland Rock guys like Seeger, Tom Petty, John Mellencamp. Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm say Mellencamp definitely falls in that category. So those are those are the kind of the artists that I gravitate towards too. When I panic on a playlist with a kid, I'm like, I need something upbeat. It's like <laughs> I go to pink houses. I you know, I just, <laughs> I just like right. I, I'm like, I, oh, the song is ending, and it's a right away. I get yelled at. So it's just like uh, something, and all those guys have like really good stuff from the old Absolutely. days. Absolutely, man. We should just. Uh... Next time we do this, we should just get Dylan um, to just like grab a guitar and we'll just we'll do a podcast. It's like a live stream of. We'll just do a live cover. (laughs) No, what I really like too is Eddie Rabbit. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a good one to go to. Yeah, Yeah, I love that one. That's a good workout song. Oh, and Steve Miller Band. Mm -hmm. They performed in Chicago, like. Wes, didn't they they performed at Wrigley Field quite a few times, didn't they? Yeah. Seems like yeah. so. I mean, they still got they still got fans coming out and selling at Wrigley Field. So they did uh didn't they do a CMT crossover with Kenny Chesney? Was that was it, yeah. was it Chesney? I want to say Could it was have Chesney. 
But sure. Yeah, I'm a big big Steve Miller fan too. I'd but, love it. Yeah. I'd love to see them live. Dylan, that was a really fast hour we had. A lot right. of fun, a lot of laughs. Good. New, good. new, new album, son of a I, it's so hard for me not to say that, uh, like another word after that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's amazing. We love it. We're gonna keep posting the stuff and no hot beers this weekend. Cold, cold beers only. Cold garage beers. But cold beer. We had a blast. If you don't mind sticking out for a minute after we hit stop record, uh, yeah. But I had a hell of a time. Yeah. yeah thank you. I, I, us too. I almost said us too, like I have a mouse in my pocket or something. <laughs> uh, me too. I had a great time with y'all, man. It was a lot of fun. Great chat. And y'all are easy to talk to. You know, it's, uh, I think, I think y'all got probably the, the best podcast out there. And I'm not even joking. Like this has been really. Best podcast, best website. Best. best. <laughs> and I, and I, God, I'll be best. straight up. Like, the social like, media, best. Keep going. <laughs> oh, I know, right? I, I was just uh, I was just gonna say that I'm I'm not super super familiar not well not it's not that I'm not familiar I'm not really used to doing podcasts it's kind of still new to me um, but I, but I will say that uh, you know I, I don't know that I've really been this comfortable on on one yet yeah. so thank you for that well thank you yeah I mean we definitely appreciate that back in the day we would book we would book these around your tour schedule and we would have you come in the office. We'd all sit and drink beer and hang out and just shoot the shit. And it was a re- it was a really good time. And now we're kind of all in different places, you know, doing it this way. But yeah, um, I think that definitely appreciate, you know, those kind of ways. Yeah, it means a lot. Yeah. Well, you, well, you know, y'all get back to that. So I'm I'm good as long as y'all don't put out a uh, Dylan Carmichael burritos a truck in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, definitely not. <laughs> All right, man. 